Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, we are uh, in our extended long uh, annual meeting. Uh, as you all know, the annual meeting uh, didn't take place in January as we planned because lots of uh, people were unable to attend at that time. And so we've been able to offer you this opportunity to hear from all the speakers and it's actually better because they each get their own slot and you can uh, uh, they can then use an uh, extended amount of time uh, to do that. I'm Sharon Terry. I'm the CEO of PXE International. Um, we welcome all of you, including those of you who will be watching the uh, recording. Um, we will ask you to remain muted until um, the end of Richard's talk, when there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers. And as usual, if there's questions later, uh, when you view the video or whatever, you can email us and we can we can get you those uh, that information. Um, this is being recorded and the recording will be on the PXE International YouTube uh, channel. And so um, we invite you to go there. Um, we send that out regularly in our newsletter and so forth. But if you need anything, you can contact me or Mary or Georgia, who's also here with us today. So happy to, to see you all. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce uh, Dr. Richard Thompson, who is uh, a professor of biochemistry and molecular biology at the University of Maryland. He also has a senior lecture, lectureship at um, the uh, Queen's University Belf Belfast, Northern Ireland, uh, UK um, institution, and has been working on some very novel things. I'll make the same kind of caveat that I make for each of these talks. And that is uh, you're gonna hear in all of these talks, lots of cutting edge stuff. Um, this is not a place for specific answers to any of your clinical needs. And uh, in this case, uh, Richard is a PhD, not an MD. And so he won't be answering any clinical questions, but we want to offer you these talks because in fact, these researchers that we've been bringing forward for you to hear are doing cutting edge research that's gonna make a difference, we believe both in the progression of PXE as well as understanding the disease. And as you know, we've been really searching hard for something called biomarkers. And so work like his really advance uh, the field in a way that we think is very important. Um, so nothing that he discusses is immediately applicable this afternoon. And that's true about all these talks. Uh, someone. Uh, in these talks might tell you about one potential treatment or another, nothing is ready for prime time. And as usual, we're keeping you up to date uh, as quickly as we can about anything that is ready for prime time. So without further ado, Richard, I'm turning it over to you. Great. Um, yeah, and, and let me say just a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I'm really honored to get a chance to talk to you folks about uh, kind of what we're doing, which uh, you know we hope will be of uh, not only of interest, but maybe of potentially of use uh, to the PXE community. Um, as uh, Sharon Terry said, I'm a, I'm a scientist. Uh, they keep me away from the patients. Um, but I think that's uh, been good for everyone. Um, one thing I, sh I should add is that we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, there's no extra charge. Um, the, uh, you know, I'm all about questions. You know, my students live to ask me questions, particularly if they think I can't answer them. So uh, you're very, very welcome in that case. Uh, again, Sharon Terry's told me that not all of you folks are scientists, so we're gonna, you know, we're gonna slow it up a little bit and uh, make sure we uh, are well covered. Great. So that's Thank you. sort of who I am, and uh, we'll uh, go to our next slide. So, um, and what I'm going to start out with is is to talk about calcification and to talk about it in a little little bit of detail. Um, I mean, my understanding is that, is that you folks, many of you, are, you know, either have family members um, or, or loved ones who are uh, who have PXE, and um, so I want to talk a little bit about the kind of the the almost the chemistry of it. But we want to sort of start with uh, kind of what the what the heck is uh, ectopic calcification, and in particular, what's this mineral doing away from my bones and my teeth, which is where it's supposed to be, and then. How, what do we use to see minerals in the body? And, and particularly, what are the limitations of X-ray and, and something called MRI? And then we're going to sort of shift more to the eye because that's sort of the, uh, the apple of our eye um, and talk about calcification there, not only in the context of PXE, but particularly in the case of 
AMD, which is a disease called age-related macular degeneration. And what you'll see is that we've been, <clears throat> um, uh, what you'll see is that we've been very interested in AMD also as a disease of calcification as PXE is, and that this is, and what, what you folks uh, you know, have encountered with PXE has been uh, uh, guiding our, uh, our our work. And then try, try to convince you that it might be useful to be able to see these, these very tiny calcifications uh, in the eye and start to ask other questions in terms of applicability. So <clears throat> this is a, uh, <laughs> um, let me see if I can move this out of my way here. So most most people here, by the way, do have PXE themselves. Um, okay. And, and they're also very familiar with AMD if they have any of the eye signs, because of course that's how clinicians are treating them now, as though it is AMD. Yeah. Well, and it, it's it's sort of wonderful that that uh, that, that approach has also been helpful. But uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll just remind you that uh, calcification is uh, really a you know a way of uh, uh, really is very similar to the the to the mineral part of your bones and, and teeth and so i've got the skeleton here and this junior vampire here um and these and these materials these minerals are mainly forms of calcium phosphate just you know and then your mom told you to you know drink your milk because it has calcium and phosphate in it and this is what basically makes the hard part of your bones um you have very specialized cells that actually do this assembly uh, to make sure that the that the bone is and and your teeth are uh, the, the 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 mineral is in the right place, and really what happens is with PXE and we believe with AMD as well is that you know, some of this mineral ends up in the wrong place and causes trouble, and so we want to try and understand those phenomena, and and maybe with a view towards uh, 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 solving them. So when we're talking about calcium phosphate, and so this is this is for all the chemists in the audience or both of you. Um, so when, when, the, when the calcium phosphate ends up in the wrong place, we call it ectopic calcification, as opposed to regular uh, calcification, if you will. Um, and all the forms of calcium phosphate, and this is one of them, uh, are insoluble in water. I mean, if you, they're, they're not like sugar or salt where you can, you know, you can put it in a pot of boiling water and you see it dissolve. And the calcium phosphate doesn't. And in fact, one form, which is the one we're most interested in, is called hydroxyapatite. And frankly, it's a hard as a rock. I mean, and it and and it basically is what makes your bones and teeth strong, mechanically strong, and enable them to do their job. <clears throat> the uh, the issue is is when this starts showing up other places. And one of the one of the things I want to mention is that if you just have some calcium and some phosphate, um, and you put them together in a test tube, they get together and they precipitate out a solution. You get you'll see a white you know, powder sitting at the bottom of your of your test tube. The problem is, is that when calcium and phosphate are both present at some reasonable concentration, they get together and they precipitate. And you have mechanisms, and one of which you're familiar with, um, that help prevent this process from occurring. You know, I think probably everyone has heard about ABCC6 and the role that it plays with a chemical called pyrophosphate in minimizing calcification. And it's a failure of that mechanism that leads to, to what occurs in, in, in PXE. So basically, when these, when these things get together and form this mineral, which can happen spontaneously, it doesn't need any, any help. If they're both there, then that's what leads to trouble. And you can see this, uh, particularly by X-ray or by uh, something called MRI. And so this is a side view of, of, of somebody's skull. And you can see a little little fade spot there in this sort of classic x-ray. If we use something called com computed tomography, which is basically a way of analyzing x-ray data that gives us a lot more information, you can see this sort of marble-sized thing inside this poor guy's skull. And this is a brain tumor that's become calcified. So basically, that, that, that tissue, which is growing out of control aberrantly, um, can get calcified, and then it's easy to see uh, inside this guy's inside this guy's skull, pushing aside his brain, and this is a 3D uh, image of that. We can also see it using a technique called MRI, and I'll I'll spare you the details of just how that works. But again, this is another individual, 
and you can see this sort of black blood blood here and if we image it uh, by ct like in the previous thing this thing turns up white now this is this is pretty good um but the problem is is that the both x-ray and mri are limited to how small the calcification that they can see and that's a and that gets to be a real problem because um, we generally believe, and I think it makes a lot of sense, that um, you know, by the time something is that big, uh, it's much harder to deal with. And if you had a choice, if you had calcification in, in your tissues or you know anywhere it's not supposed to be, um, that you really like to be able to see it sooner and 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 maybe treat it if there was a way to do that. And here's another example of calcification. Um, so this is the ankle. Of, of a guy with uh, uh, diabetes who's 50 years old. And if you look carefully, you can see kind of a little pair of railroad tracks and a little pair of railroad tracks here inside the skin next to the bone. And these are blood vessels, they're arteries that have become coated with these, with these minerals, with, these, with this calcium phosphate. And you know, so you can see this. And, and if you have diabetes or if you know people have diabetes, you know, the getting, you know, having this 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 blockage build up on the inside of your arteries limits your blood flow to your feet, your extremities, and this is a a big problem for people with diabetes, as probably a lot of you know. And you you kind of wonder what's what's the mineral doing in your blood vessels? I mean, it's uh, <laughs> why is it there? Um, and and we sort of generally think that if if we can see the calcification earlier, we might be able to do something about it and be able to see it when it's at an earlier stage, when even these thin coatings on, on here uh, are invisible. So we started, we actually got into this uh, kind of by the back door. Um, we, uh, uh, Dr. Lengel, who's also attending today, and I were very interested in zinc and the retina, and uh, particularly in the context of a disease called age-related macular degeneration. And as, uh, as Ms. Terry said, um, if you if you already had some of the eye signs of of, uh, of PXE in your uh, in your retinas, um, a lot of this is similar to AMD, and it can be treated in some cases like uh, one of the forms of AMD. So this I'm going to give you a little background on the on AMD itself. So this is this is obviously your eyeball and the iris and the lens. It focuses an image on the back of the um, on the back of the eye. Uh, when I, I in looking at, at the, the audience, um, in the old days, what I would do is I would say that the retina is like the film in a camera. But now that nobody's got a camera that takes film anymore, that's not a very good simile for what we're trying to talk about. But but basically, the the light sensors in your eye are are, are built into the retina, and this is sort of a close up image, like your eye doctor would see, of of a retina of someone who has this AMD age-related macular degeneration. And I'll just say that AMD is unlike PXE in that it's pretty common. Um, there are about 10 million people in the United States who suffer from it. And it is the most common cause of blindness, legal blindness in the elderly in the United States and really most of the developed world. And what happens here is you get these, these little sort of yellowish dots or splotches here on this part of the retina um, this part of the retina is called the macula, and this is where your high resolution vision is. So when you're sewing or when you're you're reading or driving, um, this is this is where the part of your eye that's receiving that that signal and providing the best resolution. What happens is is that these cells uh, basically end up dying off as a result of these these splotches or deposits, which are called drusen, and we'll talk more about them. Um, and when that occurs, you lose your fine vision. And so we can see these two boys here with these balls, and, and you can you could easily recognize your faces, their faces if you knew them. But if you if you look at this lower thing, it sort of simulates what happens when you get AMD in that you lose your fine vision in the center of your vision. You still can see some color, you still can see some shapes, but obviously uh, it, it's very, very difficult. So I'm going to show you a side view of the retina. So this is, we're taking a, a basically a cross section of the retina here. And what I want to, what I want to show you is that in this, in this picture, 
the light is coming through the iris from the front of your eye from the top here. And so there's there's a layer of, of some very specialized cells called rods and cones. The cones are, are pink, the rods are blue, and these are the light-sensitive cells, as many of you know, that actually do the seeing. And they're connected to the nerves and ultimately into your brain to interpret the light uh, as an image, and so you can recognize people and drive your car. Then there's a layer of cells underneath them that's called the RPE, or the retinal pigment epithelium. And you know we're, we're scientists. We never use two syllables when 11 will do. So this is called the RPE. And the supply of these, these cells up here, the, the light-sensitive ones, when you're using your vision, they're very metabolically active. They consume a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, energy. They use, use a lot of oxygen. They create a lot of, of uh, waste products. And it's partly the job of, of the RPE to, to handle that, that transmission of, uh, of nutrients and oxygen. And the nutrients and oxygen come from these blood vessels. So these are cross sections of blood vessels, something called the choriocapillaris. And in between there is, a, is an elastic membrane called Brooks membrane. And we'll be coming back to Brooks membrane in, in particular. One of the things that, that happens when you get as old as I am is you begin to develop those deposits I showed you in the last slide, these sort of yellow splotchy things. And they start to, to build up, and these are called drusen. And you can imagine that this blocks the flux of oxygen and nutrients from the blood vessels down here to getting to the rods and the cones. And when, and when you block enough of the oxygen flow and enough of the, uh, of the nutrients, these cells start to, basically they start to, to die off. Um, and that's, what, that's when we get AMD. One of the things that occurs is one form of AMD is that these, these uh, cells here, question, or I guess there's some in the chat. Um, no, these... I, think, I think you're, keep going, you're fine. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, the, when these cells start to start to starve, they send out a chemical signal basically to the, to the choriocapillaries saying, you need to connect us with some blood cells that are going to provide nutrients to us. And so you start to see blood, blood vessels growing up up through the Brooks membrane and even through the RPE up into this layer of cells. And when that occurs, the, the, in, AM, in AMD, the blood vessels are typically leaky. And so the back of your retina actually looks wet from the, from the leakiness. And, and these things basically are, are, are you know, are, are driving tunnels through your Brooks membrane and RPE. And, and it kind of trashes your, 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 vet, your retina. Um, and as you may know, uh, there's a way to prevent this. Basically, uh, something that blocks that chemical signal from these cells to this cells, so that you're no longer inducing the growth of these of these blood vessels, and and thereby your your uh, retina stays a little more intact. And these are the the drugs called uh, uh, Lucenus and Avastin are two of the common ones. So this is another view that, that sort of shows you these, these drusen. <laughs> these things that look like bottles with cones with coins in them are the are the rods and cones in the uh, in the in the retina. This is the RPE layer, and these here are the blood vessels. And your eye doctor um, can see these uh, can see these drusen either using a regular just a regular old uh, ophthalmoscope looking in your eye or sort of a fancier ophthalmoscope called an OCT, which of course stands for something un unpronounceable called optical coherence tomography. But, but again, you know, one of the th blocking the, the flux of, um, the flux of nutrients here ultimately will kill off these, these cells if we don't prevent it. And these things here, the, the drusen, are mainly made up of, of, of fats, things we call lipids, um, cholesterol esters and the like, as well as uh, particular kinds of protein. And uh, actually, Dr. Lengel and I, with uh, uh, Tony Lanzarotti and uh, Jane Flynn, uh, about 10 years ago, discovered that there was something else there. And that's why this story becomes, starts to become uh, more relevant. 
uh, to the, the PXE community. <clears throat> and, and this is an electron micrograph that, that kind of de uh, describes that. So let me orient you. So these here up here are the, are the rods and cones and the, the connecting neurons. This is the RPE cell layer. The Brooks membrane is more or less right here. And this is the troublemaker. This is the problem. This is a sphere of calcium phosphate, hydroxyapatite, that's actually trapped inside a drusen. And so if you think of it, it's kind of the filling in a, in a, in a ravioli, or, a, uh, or you can think of it if you're Polish as a pierogi. But basically, this, this is kind of a rock in there that's coated with, with protein and lipid. And this is what's causing all the trouble. To give you an idea how big this is, it's only a few microns across. And okay, what does that mean? To give you an idea, so if, if I mean, I'm almost out of hair, but you know, if you pulled one of my hairs out, the diameter of the hair, you know, that cylinder of the hair fall, of the, the hair is about a hundred microns. And so if I if I look at this thing here, if I had about a dozen of these across there like that, that would be the thickness of a human hair. This red blood cell gives you an accurate measure because it's about six or eight microns in diameter. This is the choroid, and you can see the, the blood cells in there. <clears throat> if you sort of look at this using a different technique, um, what we can do is we can we have chemicals we can use that stain the calcium phosphate. They stick to it, and they have a particular property called fluorescence, meaning that they, they glow if we shine a, a, shine a light on them like a black light. And these are pictures that Dr. Lengel actually took. And what you can see is that there's kind of a lot of these little, these little magenta or pink circles. And these are those, those little spheres of hydroxyapatite. And uh, I, this is a family program, so I can't tell you what I told Dr. Lengel when, he, when we first started looking at this and seeing these data, because I, I thought it was crazy. I mean, I could not understand why you would want to have any something like hydroxyapatite, a mineral, a rock sitting in the back of your retina. And what we came to understand is that is that the, the hydroxyapatite, in our view, promotes the growth of the drusen, that it kind of works like a like the hair in a drain clog where these other greasy and proteinaceous things stick to it. And these images here are, are pictures of the spheres that are coated with different proteins that are characteristic of the drusen. And this is what really uh, really uh, put the fat in the fire as far as we were concerned in terms of giving us an idea of how these drusen would start to form and and why they were so, why they would tend to form there and not somewhere else. And so this is in our view was a form of ectopic calcification. There's that word again. And so if we um, <clears throat> start to think about taking pictures of that, so I'll just say that again, these are microscopic things, okay? Um, like a, a compared to a, a bacteria, a single bacteria, these things uh, typically are about the same size. They get to be bigger, they get to be a few microns, but in the whole, they're really, really small. And that's one of the one of the the big issues here. And what we were thinking was is if we can predict, if we can measure calcification in the retina, in your retina, maybe that will enable us to predict whether AMD is going to occur, whether you're going to get the growth of these, of these drusen. The problem is, is that as we look, as we saw before, that uh, that um, our 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 X-ray and our uh, and our um, MRI techniques aren't going to be able to see something that small. I mean, not by a, not by a long shot. I mean, probably the minimum things that you can um, that you can see. You know, reliably in deep tissue with cal with a X-ray or computer tomography or MRI is, you know, it's something about the size of, of a pencil eraser, and so these little bitty things are a hundred times smaller than that at least, and so you're not going to see them with that, and so how can we see it? And in particular, we would like to be able to image calcification in the living retina. I mean, these pictures I've shown you here, these are retinas uh, from people who have been kind enough to donate their their bodies to science literally and enabled us to to do these experiments but these are you know these were uh, these images were made by taking you know eyeballs out of a out of a, a donor cadaver and spreading them out on a, on a flat sheet 
So we'd like to be able to do that in the living retina. And, you know, can we do that for AMD? Can we do it for PXE? And if we're doing fluorescence, how are we going to stain these? Because these were made with, with a particular stain that works great, but it's not something you want to put into your body. Um, I mean, we use it for in animal models, but, but it's not a, it's not used, used in humans and uh, it may be toxic. It may not, it may not go to the right places. And so uh, we were faced with coming up with a different stain. Um, and what we ended up uh, doing was using an antibiotic that uh, probably some of you are old enough to have had um, called tetracycline. And so this is, this is the hero of the piece. This is tetracycline. And this is the antibiotics, you know, some of you folks may have had when you were little kids. These two things here are, are chemicals that we also use to stain things. But I mean, th these are dyes. I mean, these are not, they're not safe or known to be safe for use in humans. <clears throat> and, and this is why tetracycline is interesting. So this is actually a cross-section of a child's tooth. I'm sure we got it from the tooth fairy, but this this child um, was given multiple courses of tetracycline antibiotics to treat for ear infections and you know scrapes and, and all the things that happen to kids when they're young, and so these yellow green stripes are, are fluorescence that comes from the tetracycline where it's stuck to the hydroxyapatite, the calcium phosphate bone mineral that makes up this tooth. And so we started thinking in terms of, you know, can we can we feed an animal in this case um, a tetracycline uh, as a pill as an antibiotic, um, and use that to stain the hydroxyapatite uh, that might be present in their eye. And so we we tried this out on again on uh, on some uh, donor eyes. And so this is a picture of the retina where we removed almost everything except for the the the, uh, the the bottom part of it. And what you can see here are these, these sort of big drusen. And, and this is a, a fluorescence picture because we stained this with a with chlor tetracycline. Uh, some of you may have heard of this called oreomycin. And what you can see is that the drusen are sort of lighting up very brightly, but some of them are just kind of barely, barely visible there. And so we decided to use a trick um, it actually was invented here at Maryland uh, 30 years ago um, by Joe Lackwitz called a, a fluorescence lifetime imaging. And I'm not going to try and explain to you about what a fluorescence lifetime is, but basically it's a characteristic of fluorescence like color or intensity that we can use to distinguish the emission from the emission from, from our tetracycline from the fluorescence emission that's just present in the background of your retina. And this specimen is actually from a 94-year-old woman who, who died as a result of encephalopathy, hypertension, and dementia. And so we can use a trick that enables us to kind of zoom in on the portions of the image. I mean, this is a, a it's a digital image and it's 256 pixels by 256 pixels. But we can basically gather together the pixels that have this fluorescence lifetime that's the right number and, and highlight them. And that's what happens here on this slide. So this is, this is I'll, I won't try to explain how the phaser plot works, but basically inside this red circle are gathered, the pic, are plotted the pixels that have a lifetime that's pretty close to the lifetime that we measured for the chlor tetracycline when it's stuck to the, the calcium phosphate. And I, I, I'm not hearing any snoring, so I think you guys are, are still with me. Okay, so so what? So what happens is that highlights the pixels here in these drusen, including these here, which are kind of small. And for the most part, we don't see any pixels that are here in the background. On the other hand, if we highlight the pixels that are most of the pixels in the image that have a much shorter lifetime, the pixels that light up are all the ones in the background and the ones in the drusen don't at all. So we're, so the contrast in this image is not only from the fluorescence intensity, which is what's given in, in what we call false color. So the very brightest pixels are, are red, but also we can distinguish in the basis of this fluorescence lifetime business. 
And what the reason for doing this is that we want to be able to see these sort of very early on um, truzen that haven't grown as big as as these here. I mean, and these are you know fifty microns, so they're they're pretty big. But even these little these little these little baby ones seem to be um, uh, seem to be also lighting up selectively. So you have calcification in your retina if you have if you have PXC, and and these are some pictures from from Dr. Langill, where he's show he's stained. So this is what's called a flat mount of your retina. So it's like it's like if you if you take a a, a grapefruit and slice it in as thin thin slices, you can lay it out flat. And what you can see in this, in this elderly person's eye is is lots of sort of white dots here in the center which is close to the macula that we talked about before. And if we compare that to a person with, with PXE, whoops, let's go back one. Person with PXE, there's also lots of white dots and there's little, you can just barely see them here, there's little lines. If we look more close up, the aged eye sort of has these spots. We call these things uh, snowflakes and they're gatherings of, of calcification. But the PXE patient, and I don't think this is an elderly person, um, has basically lines of pink that look basically like cracks, which is kind of what they are. Because what's happened is your Brooks membrane, uh, the, again, that thin membrane in your retina has become very heavily calcified. And, and when that happens, it becomes rigid. And so instead of being like a, you know, like a, like a volleyball, it's more like a Christmas tree ornament and so it cracks when it gets any stress. And so you have these angioid streaks, which your, your eye doctor can see, um, even, in, even in your retina. And these streaks are actually cracks. And so this is a side view also from Dr. Langell. And so here are the, the, the what we call the neural retina with the, 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 um, the rods and cones, the light sensitive uh, cells, as well as the, the neurons. But down here at the bottom, we have this pink line. And this is the Brooks membrane. And you can see, except for this crack here, it's sort of solid. But it basically is completely calcified. And we even see some calcification on the inside of, of these uh, these blood vessels in the choroid. So the the the, the point of this is, is that um, the calcification that occurs in the PA, in a person with PXE in their eye, I mean, it's its distribution is different but it may be uh, part of the same process. And the tools that we use to study this process may end up being useful, not only for AMD, but also for PXE. And so sort of our next questions or our next big steps are, can we image calcification in an AMD in an animal model? And with a little bit of luck, we're gonna start a, a, an animal a trial here where we're gonna give the animal a, a, a an antibiotic. And one of the nice things about this antibiotic is it's been in, used in, in humans for 50 years. You know, it's very safe. We know what the risks are. Um, we know what the where where it goes in your body. So we know that it actually, when it's put into your into your circulation, it will go and stain the calcification in a cadaver in the in the retina, um, the same as it would uh, your teeth if you were a child. And so this leads to our next question is, can we do the same thing in patients? And in particular, is that going to tell us anything about where we're going to get drusen and what, what our propensity for getting, um, what our propensity for getting AMD as a result of that? And maybe this predictive value may also be of use in predicting in, in PXE patients, whether they're going to start to experience some of these, uh, some of these uh, eye issues. Bigger questions are, can we also image this, these little calcifications in deep tissue? So we said before that you, you really can't see using an X-ray or a CAT scan um, or an MRI. You can't see things that are you know, much smaller than a pencil eraser. And we want to see things that are real small before they've gotten to become big. And we'd like to be able to see them you know, in, your, you know, in your blood vessels, uh, you know, your, uh, your, your heart valves, all the places that calcification starts making trouble um, and, uh, and and creating disease. 
And then finally, the $64 question is, uh, uh, what can we do to slow or stop or even reverse this calcification? And uh, this is a, in our minds, this is obviously a very big question. And we're starting to consider some, I, I think uh, I think uh, Dr. Lingen would call them wacky ideas uh, to try and do this. But uh, uh, I think there's uh, there may be some possibilities. Certainly, as we understand better why ectopic calcification occurs in some places and not others, as we get understand the mechanisms that help prevent this from occurring, you know, you know about pyrophosphate, maybe CC6. There are others, um, and understanding where they occur and how they work and what might get in their way and what we can do to maybe replace them that uh, um, maybe we can start to avoid calcification altogether. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm uh, happy to try and answer any questions. Great, thanks very much. Okay, the floor is open. You can unmute, you can raise your hand, you could put a question in the chat. There's a number of ways to. Can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead, Colleen. Please. I am, a patient. I am not a doctor, scientist, nothing of that nature, just so you know. I have PXE, and um, I'm wondering if this calcification can come out in the form of like sleepy stuff in your eyes in the morning. Is that, um, that it, it's a little it's a little different than that i mean the 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 you know the sand that the sandman puts in your eyes at night and, and you wake up in the morning and you got to rub it out the, that's a that's a different material this is actually more it's it's really more like sand it's like a rock and and colleen we want to be super clear though that what richard's describing is in the retina so it can't be actually affected by any topical agent at all so this is something else that's happening for you and um we appreciate that but the the stuff that richard's talking about is in the retina beneath the brooks membrane and so uh nothing topical you put on your eye will help that thanks colleen other questions Hi, I have a question. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, Gopi, go. uh, you can go and then Hope has her hand up. Hope you're, you'll be next. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, Dr. Thompson, I was wondering about LASIK eye surgery. Is that something that um, patients with PXE, I do have angioid streaks. I had a... Um, retina vein occlusion, and that's how I found out about my PXE. So I'm just curious as to um, if LASIK vision can be done and if um, that can I, um, elongate the vision as we age. Um, I, I think in the, I mean, what LASIK does is it, is it basically remodels your lens itself and it's done using a laser beam. Um, and so our, really, our problem is in, is in the back of the eye and the retina, sort of instead of the lens of the camera, the film of the camera. And so uh, I think that LASIK is, is, not, is not likely to be terribly helpful in this instance. And, but maybe you know better, Sharon, and, and I should defer to yeah. you. No, so, so LASIK absolutely works great for the typical other eye issues like needing better distance or near vision and lots of people with PXE have had it done because it's again it's the lens in front of the eye and has nothing to do with the retina so um, the same thing with lots of people are asking about uh, cataract surgery sure you know have it because it's again not affecting the retina um, and so neither of those will help PXC vision problems but normal vision problems like many of us have um, needing glasses or whatever you could. Yep. <laughs> Rich, Richard could opt for LASIK if he wanted. Yep. And uh, so, yeah, so that's perfectly fine. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And just a reminder, Richard is not an MD. He is a scientist studying the structure of the retina. So uh, we'll limit the questions to that and also not personal questions because he won't be able to answer those. And it's not even legal, even if he was an MD for him to answer those. So I think Hope, you're next. Um, you showed us a slide with an, a person's ankle, which was coated with um, calcium phosphate. 
And I realize that you are specializing in eyes, so it's a little bit far from the ankle. But just because I saw that um, that slide, um, is it? Do you think from your research that it's it's going to be likely to dissolve the buildup of um, this calcium phosphate? in arteries or in the wall of the arteries at some point is your research heading in that direction because once you've identified things it'd be nice to feel that we were also heading towards removing the source the cause of the problem well uh i, I guess what i would say is is that we we very much have that in mind the the problem with calcification particularly with hydroxyapatite is that from if you're if you're a chemist and a thermodynamicist, it's a very very stable compound, and to get rid of it, basically what you need is acid, which is not generally a good idea to have flowing through your veins or in your eye or something like that, and so your the cells that that build and take take down your bone actually create acid, but in a very very localized spot. Um, to do this. And so, you know, whether it will be possible to adapt that sort of a, of a process or something different where we can, where we can essentially dissolve the hydroxyapatite using acid in a way that doesn't, you know, start dissolving everything else, which would be a big problem um, is, uh, is, you know, one of the things that we're thinking about, but, but that's still very much at the cocktail napkin stage. And, uh, you know, we've got ways ways to go with that, and you know, but we think it'll be useful to be able to image calcification when it's in this little tiny stage, not but not by the time you. But I mean, from our standpoint, we th we think that not entirely, but by the time it's gotten big enough to see with X-ray, the CAT scan, MRI, you know, the boat's kind of sailed. That that you know, the damage is is great or potentially great. And once it gets that big that you've got a problem. So we would like to, to see it sooner rather than later and hopefully, you know, put a stop to it somehow. And so Richard, we have two questions in the chat and then one person has their hand up. Um, the first one is, what kind of hardware imaging are you thinking about for doing the in situ microscopic imaging? Oh, we have an absolutely dandy device that some company invented. Um, so if, if you think of going to your eye doctor and he or she uses a, a thing that kind of kind of a camera looking thing that looks into your eye, that's called an ophthalmoscope. And this is a very fancy ophthalmoscope um, that is a very fancy ophthalmoscope that makes images with fluorescence lifetimes. We call it a FLEO because it's a kind of long name. But the FLEO it will enable us to do this. And with a little bit of luck in, in the next couple of months, we'll be able to start an animal trial um, where the animal is a model. It actually develops drusen. It, it eats a Western diet, right? A lot of fats and stuff. The animal develops the uh, these drusen. And we want to see whether we can see them early with our, by feeding the animal also, some, some uh, uh, core tetracycline. Is uh, is the basic of the idea. So, um, is that? Uh, uh, Thank you. It's your question. Um, I'm going to go on to the next one so we can get them all in. Are there any conditions where one is uh, one is aware of where abnormal calcium deposition can be currently reduced or reversed? Presumably, presumably, it may affect normal calcium deposition. Uh, I mean, apart from mechanically removing it you know, with a scalpel, uh, none that I'm aware of. Um, uh, maybe Dr. Langill knows of one that I, that I don't, but uh, I'm not aware of any. And we have a PXE researcher who's been working probably about six or seven years with PXE support, uh, international support, trying to use macrophages to digest the calcium and so far not, not terribly successful. All right, so Colleen, you're up. I'll just remind you, if you need a test subject, I'm willing, just don't cut me. 
well, the, 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 the animals are, are, are pretty willing because they're fast asleep. Um, yeah. but, but really, the, the, the idea here is we just want to make this essentially the same as your, as you know, when you go to the, to the eye doctor, he or she you know, takes an image of your, um, of your retina. We want it to be just like that. I mean, in our minds, what we want to plan to do is to give you the tetracycline. We'll wait 12 hours. Your system clears it out. We know just how that works for many years. Your system clears most of it out, and the ones and the the rest that's stuck in on your retina will be able to image with our fancy uh, ophthalmoscope. So it really is going to be kind of like going to to the docs for an eye exam. And something we're also very interested in is you see some uh, somewhat different kind of uh, uh, calcification in what's called the periphery of the retina. Um, where so if you if you think of if you think of the back of the eye as sort of a ball here, so the 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 lights coming in this way and that's the retina back here, in the periphery of the retina, sort of right behind the the, the lens, um, you also get deposits if you have Alzheimer disease, and so we we don't know whether this is important in Alzheimer's disease, but uh, it, I think probably a lot of you folks know that. Uh, you know, people are very interested in detecting Alzheimer's early, again, with the idea of being able to treat it before the dementia catches up and becomes a, a very difficult problem that it is. And uh, so we're very excited about that. We have funding from the National Institute of Aging to start to look at that relationship of calcification between your retina in the context of AMD and your retina in the context of Alzheimer's disease. So we're, uh, we, uh, we, we, we're, we're, we're very keen to, uh, to get started on this uh, animal study. And, uh, and we'll, we'll be knocking on your door if, uh, if things go well with the animals. Great. Other questions? Richard, I'm wondering, you know, we heard at the last PXE research meeting in Budapest from um, the folks who are doing light dark adaptation, um, Maximilian and Christina, and they've, um, presented here as well, uh, whether or not you are also uh, able maybe to find uh, the actual physical manifestation of this loss in terms of the of the uh, light dark adaptation. And there may be a correlation between your work and their work that could be very supportive of biomarkers. Have you guys thought about that? Yeah, we're, we're huge fans of Maximilian and Christina and their work. It's uh, we think it's and and from the standpoint of doing light dark adaptation, that's a uh, that's a, a very attractive approach. For the same reason, I mean, it's you know, it's not very painful. It's it's just a simple uh, uh, assay. Um, I don't know how closely that's related to what what we're looking at. Uh, again, maybe Dr. Lang will have something to say here from his uh, from his closet there. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, yes, just, just a very brief uh, uh, comment on that one. It's very likely that the death of the photoreceptors is related to the calcification. This blockade between the vascular, the, the blood supply and the cells uh, causes the loss of the cells that produce that light dark adaptation uh, issue. So it is it is almost certain that it's related but the relationship is not fully understood mm -hmm. cool thank you another question in the chat does any of what you have described about wet age related macular degeneration also apply to dry macular degeneration um yeah it's it's actually a a, a pretty complex question and so just to give you some background uh, about 85% of, of cases of AMD are uh, age-related macular degeneration are what's called dry AMD, and they don't result in the, the growth of the blood vessels up through the, up through the back of the retina and, and destroying things. Uh, only 15% of AMD cases are, are, are get that far. Um, and, and as we said, these, uh, these, uh, these uh, chemical signal inhibitors, VEGF inhibitors, you know, are dandy for stopping that process. Um, but it's all, it's, I think it's, I, th I think it might be fair to say that there's a, a lot of agreement that if you had um, 
if you had a uh, if you waited long enough with dry AMD, you eventually would get to having wet AMD. And so, really, we want to what we want to try and do from the standpoint of AMD is to recognize it and stop it beforehand. And and there's a lot of folks who are who are trying to develop many different uh, 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 pharmaceuticals to try and inter, uh, intervene in that uh, in that development process. And what we what we feel are, at least in the context of AMD, that our, our role will be to sort of, uh, you know, uh, be an early diagnostic, something that would cue treatment to say, okay, we've, we've got some method to treat AMD and stop that breakdown of the, of the, of the, uh, of the retina. But uh, we need to know when to do it and to whom, and that's going to be uh, that's going to be an important thing. And that's where we see our, in the case context of AMD, where that's going. Did, did that answer your question? I think I might have drifted away from what you asked. That was in the chat, so um, oh. um, we'll assume that yes, it did. Other I might, uh, if you don't mind, yes, I just that add did, to that, 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 that. Did that answer my question? Um, so uh, I did want to respond and say yes. Um, <laughs> okay, Emre is going to also give us a little uh, insight to go ahead, Emre. Yes, yeah, just just a, a little addition to Richard is that when the uh, Brooks membrane breaks, then we have new vessels growing in. But before that, uh, the calcification actually leads to <clears throat> the dry form of AMD which we show, uh, sorry, uh, the dry form for AMD, which we showed on clinical samples. So yes, I think both uh, the dry and the wet form are associated with calcification. Great, thank you. One, qu one question as a follow-up. So w w jumping then to PXE, are the early stages of PXE, do you think, going to calcif are going to be detectable like the you are hoping to be able to detect the early stages of dry AMD? We hope so. Um, and uh, we, we're, we're a little more focused on AMD in part because we have better animal models, but uh, Dr. Langill and, and his colleagues in the Netherlands and in Scotland uh, also have animal models. And so that's a, just the sort of thing that we want to get to exploring here in the very near future. Hey. And if, if, if you for... can add, add to that just uh, very briefly, it seems that in uh, Pseudosantum elasticum, there is this spread of calcification that eventually leads to uh, more and more severe disease. So the sooner we could see that, the sooner we could uh, think of uh, intervening that. So we might be able to get to the position where we would be <clears throat> able to stop the growth of the disease. We might not reverse it, but at least if we can stop it before it actually causes the kind of problems that uh, uh, many of you are experiencing, that would be an incredible achievement. We'd be Thank really you. glad to do that. <laughs> yes. Super. Well, I think we've covered it and uh, very grateful, Richard, for your contribution to today, but more importantly to the science that we hope is going to advance the kinds of things that people want to see in terms of living with this disease. So we're grateful and happy. And, and thank you, Emery's <laughs> clapping. That's really great. Um, um, cool. And uh, we will keep, of course, in touch as we always do. And, and just so that everybody knows we are working together in a big consortium of PXE researchers. Uh, and so we have the benefit of working with each other regularly. Well, yeah, and thanks everyone for listening. Uh, we appreciate it and we, we appreciate your support. Thanks very Wonderful. much. Wonderful. Thank you.